Hello, this is Professor Reardon for University of Calgary CPSC 526 Lecture 16. Now we've talked about web and web security a little bit, talking about the same origin policy. Um, now we're going to look at attacks on web apps. So a number of different uh, vulnerabilities, risks, things to be worried about when producing some sort of web application. Or So now we're thinking you know, in terms of the server side, um, how to protect the server code that is that is actually enabling the web app. So again, a lot of the design decisions for HTTP come from its original purpose, which was for physicists to share papers amongst themselves. It was not designed for what it evolved into. And um, now we see that a lot of software is being implemented just as a web-based server. It's no longer the case that you install some software on your computer and then run the software to have access to some services. Frequently, many different things that we might want to use on our computers are all delivered to us via the web. So we don't even need to install anything ahead of time. We simply go to a website and this website provides all of the code and server-side implementation necessary in order for us to do all sorts of things like banking, shopping, government, bill payments, tax preparations, doing emails, uh, inter uh, interacting with social networks, and so forth. It's no longer the case that we have different programs for all these things. We have one program, a web browser, and that web browser allows us to do a whole slew of different types of uh, software as because it's all delivered as a web-based service. And um, it's quite common as well to simply use HTML or uh, use HTTP to monitor your own simple program. So if you write a program and you want to see what it's doing or you want to check some aspects of it out or you want to control it in some way, it's tedious to write an entire graphical user interface. It's not very usable to have it only working on the console. And so a, a very simple and easy to achieve compromise is to simply include an uh, HTTP server. So you include a library that runs an HTTP server and that has basically no cost. And then you can, in a sense, log into your program by going to localhost port with the port being that which you're running your HTTP server on. And then whatever code you write to render the web page will then be shown to you. So if you want to have a bunch of buttons to do different things, or you want to output some diagnostics, or you want to output the values of certain variables, or whatever information you might want to present to yourself, or whatever information, or whatever you may want to control, you can do it very easily and much, much very easily compared to writing your own GUI and much more pleasant than doing it all on the console. So the web is, has many, many uses. Now, We've talked about the code running on the client, which is the JavaScript. And as well, we have for web apps, the code running on the server. So this could be any number of languages. You can have it written in C++ or C, and or there might be an SQL database. PHP is a, is a popular one as well. There's all sorts of web technologies that could be running on the server side. The point is that somehow information goes from the web server to the actual program that does stuff. And this program, therefore, would interpret a HTTP request as inputs to a program and then run it. And that means that it really can just do whatever it wants. It's just taking what the client provides in the form of a GET request and running it as a program. And it can be a simple, straightforward thing that doesn't involve any extra languages, or it can be basically turned into inputs for a full C++ program that does any number of different things. So from the client side, all they really still do are things like get and post requests. So you can say, do a get request on slash post with a bunch of arguments. And we saw how HTTP handles arguments. And you can provide whatever name or whatever uh, key and values you want to pass into as input for the web request. Now, a key is that um, there could be vulnerabilities if these values are interpreted or assumed to have a certain structure but don't. And um, as well, there can be vulnerabilities if somebody else can produce one of these requests. Because imagine that if 
for instance, one of these GET requests that caused a program to run had a real-world event trigger as a consequence, in a sense had a side effect, then that side effect could be achieved by anyone, by an Eve, who wanted to, for instance, have that occur, would be able to issue the same sort of request and then trigger that event to occur. For instance, imagine delete account or something like that, cause the user's account to be deleted. Well, we would want to make sure that we cannot, uh, we cannot inadvertently do that. So there are three classes of web vulnerabilities, um, or at least there's three major uh, significant classes, and these are the ones that we're going to be talking about in the, the remaining lectures for this course. The first is called cross-site request forgery, and XSRF, also known as CSRF. This is where a bad website forces the user's browser to send a request to a good website. So a bad website makes the user's browser trigger some GET request to a good website, and a problem here is that the user's browser will automatically include their cookie. This is by design. So when a user is going to visit, goes to a good website, their cookie will be attached. And if they're using a cookie for authentication, if it's a, the cookie stores a magic number that only the user would know, then the cross-site request forgery will allow the the will have the, the browser ink staples on the cookie and passes it along. And note that they would otherwise have no ability to obtain this cookie. So the reason that cross-site request forgery is a threat is because the user has be, is the one making the request, but in a, they're sort of tricked or their their browser is tricked into making the request against the user's own desires. Then there is code injection. This is where some data is sent from the client to the server. And for instance, say it's a name or say it's some particular value. But because of uh, a bug in the software, that data is interpreted as code. And SQL injection attacks are the most famous example of that, where you can basically, if the input string is not correctly sanitized, you can have control characters such as ending the quote or like a, a quotation, which would end a string, and then everything else that occurs after it would no longer be considered as part of the string. So we'll, we'll talk about a bunch of different SQL and, or code injection attacks. And then the final one is called cross-site scripting. So, or XSS attacks. So this is where malicious code is injected into a trusted context. In, the, in this case, malicious data is presented by an honest website and is interpreted as code by the user's browser. And so there's a number of different ways that this can occur in practice, but uh, as sort of the metaphor to think about here is, for instance, imagine on a forum where people can provide any posts, someone posts JavaScript, and when someone else loads your post, you're given this JavaScript, and you run it, because you're interpreting their, their text their, uh, as code, and you're running it. And the reason that this is a problem is because now the code, this, this code that is being presented to the to the to the uh, by the honest website is going to run with the same origin as this website. When anyone can write a post and an honest website just provides these posts out to people, well, then that means that anyone can inject information into the context of this website. And if it's the case that they can inject JavaScript code that then gets run by other users as JavaScript code, it means that they have been able to violate this sense of a same origin policy by allowing JavaScript code to be presented by a trusted website that isn't actually been uh, authorized to be there by the trusted website. So an important aspect to a lot of these attacks is, again, this cookie-based authentication. So I want to revisit this again. The, the reason that this is so crucial is because so much of the web is security on the web is based on the randomness of these cookies 
that users present to the server every time. And if a an attacker is able to obtain the cookie of a client for a website, they are then able to impersonate them. They're able to log in as them. If they were logged in, if they had an ongoing login session, they could continue it. They could basically act as as the as the uh, sending emails, or if they're logged into a bank, uh, and then do uh, financial transactions. And the 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 thing to keep in mind is if you have a laptop logged into some services and you shut your laptop and you go to a different a different place, a cafe, and you log in there, you don't need to re-log in typically to all of the services you've already been logged into. This is despite the fact that now your IP address has changed and you're contacting from a different location. So it is the case that it that these cookies are the thing that gives you security. It's not looking at the IP address of where you're coming from or if you move your computer to a different room or to a different building, you're going to have a different uh, you may have a different IP address. Uh, these are not factors in this authentication model. It works as follows. The browser sends to the server a, a post request for example um, to log in um, and then the browser or the server sends back to the browser a cookie and it has some particular number. And then later, whenever the browser wants to obtain another website from the server, this cookie, this magic number is automatically sent along. And if the numbers match, that means that it's the user who did the login step earlier. This is like the Kerberos ticket that means that the user has previously authenticated, is now holding an authenticator, providing that authenticator to the server every time it's doing any interaction so that they don't have to present their password every time they want to do anything. This cookie just sits in their browser and is the magic number that refers to the previous authentication that has occurred. The other relevant detail is that the browser sandbox is based on the same origin policy. So the interesting thing about the same origin policy is that it doesn't apply to rights but it rather applies to reads. So if you think of, for instance, access control for uh, a file system, we, in a sense, elevate writes as being more significant, more invasive permission than reads because writes can change data and, and cause damage. And similarly, if you look at a permission system for the, for instance, Android mobile phone, you have a write to the file system is implies that you can read to it, or write to the calendar implies that you can read to it. So the same origin policy, in contrast, however, doesn't place prohibitions against writing across origins, but it does place prohibitions against reading the results that come back. So active content, like a script, can cause web traffic to be sent anywhere. It can cause the user's browser to go out and get some data from a, from a, a cross sites to a different origin. It can have clients issue requests for content. The thing is, it just can't actually read what the response is. So it can cause the client to do web traffic, and the same origin policy prevents them from seeing what the result is. So they can, for instance, have the user's um, Facebook status page retrieved and placed on as an iframe inside of their browser, but they cannot actually cause themselves to learn what that is. They can't read what was then delivered to by Facebook and have it sent off back to the evil website that caused it to load. This is the same origin policy in action, working as intended. So the idea is that it can cause remote content to load and be rendered onto the user's screen, but there is strict prohibitions against reading what that result is. Now, importantly, as particularly as it applies to cookie authentication, when that request is issued by the browser, when that request goes out, the browser automatically adds the user's cookies to the request. Again, this is the internet working as intended. Cookies are applied automatically, added to all web requests if there is a relevant cookie to add. 
So a evil site can cause a user to go out and retrieve some content from a third party from outside of the same origin, and that user will automatically add their cookie, that is their authenticator, the, the entity that proves that they've already authenticated with that service, and thereby get tailored information uh, particular to them. And the security mechanism that prevents an evil site from learning this is the same origin policy prohibiting the reads. However, this is exactly the issue with cross-site request forgery, which is what happens if there are side effects that occur simply by virtue of a request. That is, if a request is issued, can there be a, an immediate side effect? So, for example, suppose that a user logs into their bank, bank.com, and they don't sign off. So they remain logged in. The session cookie remains in, a, in the browser state. The session cookie will automatically be appended to any query that goes to that bank. Now, suppose that the user then visits a malicious website that has some form where the, when the action of clicking the OK button, for example, on this form, causes bank.com slash billpay.php, some script, some server-side script that, in this case, would pay a bill, for example, and it sends the... the it just needs the recipient's name, so the recipient uh, value is equal to the bad guy, whoever is trying to set up this form, and then using active content like a script, has a bill pay form dot submit, so immediately calls the submit button instead of relying on the user to click it. So now, what will happen is the user, upon loading this page, will run the script, which will click the button, which will have the user load bank.com slash bill pay, passing in bad guy as a recipient for some bill to be paid. So if this actually has the immediate consequence of the user then actually losing money, that is that they will then go to their bank and in effect make an HTTP GET request or, or, or a POST request, however this form is, is implemented, that would cause them to actually immediately lose money, then it doesn't matter that there was authentication and that they logged in uh, or, and they, they were entered their password or something like that, or the same origin policy. None of these things will protect the user because what will end up happening is the, the consequence of paying the bill will just be triggered automatically. That this remote bad site is causing the user's bank to issue a transaction which the user appends their own authenticator to and the result is an actual harm, an actual loss of money uh, to the user. And in this case, the problem is in fact with the bank. It is the bank's web, uh, the website of the banks, they have to be certain that any transaction that involves side effects, that involves actual consequences, actually came from the user and not from a cross-site request forgery. So how do they actually prevent this from happening? Well, you may have seen in some cases that you don't simply have side effects trigger immediately, but you actually have to click through a series of buttons to confirm transactions. This helps usability as well, so that users can actually, when using the site properly, have an opportunity to revisit and review these things. But what can happen even still is if the bad website can anticipate the series of buttons that they'll have to press, the series of GET requests or POST requests that they'll have to make in order to simulate the user actually going and clicking all these buttons, then the evil site will be able to do that again as well. And it's important to note that the user can will always add their authenticator. So the fact that the cookie is a random number doesn't protect the user. What ends up happening is that the evil website, the one doing this cross-site request forgery, they never learn the cookie. They, they're not able to start impostering as the user. They're not able to actually issue their own requests from themselves. But what they're doing is they're tricking the user into making requests that the user is not actually interested in making. And this sort of thing affects anything that has consequences. So any web service that you use where there's con where there are consequences to button presses 
or such will be affected. This is a concern for all such things. So Amazon purchasing items, changing settings on Netflix, all of these websites that have consequences to inter their interactions are at risk for these cross-site request forgeries. So in short, a cross-site request forgery allows one site, an evil site, to issue requests to, an to another site, the victim site, or the bank in the previous example, where the user adds their authenticators and makes it look as though it came directly from the user when in fact it did not. And unfortunately, this is just the web working as intended because we have the we do allow scripts to issue requests across sites. We just don't allow them to read the results. So the same origin policy does not prevent scripts from sending queries to other sites. It just prevents them from actually hearing back what they say. And of course, uh, uh, just the rhetorical question is how often do you logged into any sites where you may have consequences to such a thing? So how often do you remain logged into your email, your, you know, in your banking site? You may think that the more important something is or the more se secure, like a bank, you tend to log out of more promptly, whereas other things like email, you just remain logged in uh, all, all of the time. And of course, this is mainly an issue when you actually visit other sites at the same time, which is also a typical use case for the internet. And as well, we don't want a world where every time you want to do banking, you have to, in effect, use a different computer or turn off your browser and close everything and then open only the one browser and use different uh, and, and never allow any websites to be loaded in parallel. This is not how we actually want the web to work because frequently we want to be able to do many things at once. We're multitasking. We have lots of things happening in, sim in parallel and we just want the web to work without the users having to bear this additional burden of knowing uh, to, of having to close everything just to do something sensitive. Another example, um, this is no an attack known as drive-by farming. The idea here is that a victim would visit a website. So for instance, a, a victim is somehow asked to click a link. So they click a link and what ends up happening is their router's DNS changes. So how does this happen? Well, routers often have HTTP interfaces. Again, we talked about this earlier. HTTP is a great way of just having a simple user interface without a huge amount of effort to set one up. So these are frequently used. And typically routers sit on 192.168.0.1. This is just a standard IP address that most home routers are configured to run on. And if it's not that, then it's 1.1 at the end instead. In effect, these are not random. They're very predictable. They're easy to guess. So suppose you have a, a router sitting on that, that IP address. Well, what can happen is if the user is tricked into going into their router, they can change settings with such a cross-site request forgery. So they, the victim would go to this website, and on this website there's a script that causes that, that makes a load occur on 192.168.0.1 slash h w a n dhcp.cgi question mark dns1 equals w x y z so what this is suggesting can happen is that by virtue of just going to this website the dns changes that this router was able to what had this remote configuration option which worked entirely using HTTP gets. And so if you wanted to change your DNS, in effect, when you go through the menus on the interface, the result is just this website gets loaded, that you set the DNS one equals to some IP address. And so if you just get the user to go to this link directly, and it has the consequence of actually changing your DNS, then it's simple enough for a user to just go to any malicious website that causes this script to to that attempts to load the script, loading the script is in effect the same as changing your DNS settings. And of course, it is happening across origins because whatever website is the evil website is not likely to be running on the router itself. But the fact that the user's browser will happily load this website when being asked to causes this vulnerability to occur. Now, 
maybe the what will end up happening is that the user is not authenticated with their router because they have to enter in their password. So this may may not uh, may not work in the end. But if the user happened to already have been logged into their router, then this would happen trivially. And again, there's other ways of doing similar sorts of attacks that don't require this additional cost. So. Of course, changing the DNS is super bad. We talked about this in, in the topics of network security. And the main reason why changing DNS is bad is because it allows off-path attackers to promote themselves to become on-path attackers. And on-path attackers tend to have far more capabilities, far more powers than off-path attackers. So if you can change your DNS server, it's the same as doing a DNS poisoning on all of your domains. If you change the DNS server, you're changing who you ask when you want to get a domain resolved. And if you change your DNS server and you start asking the bad guy whenever you want your DNS resolved, the bad guy can tell you any answer the bad guy wants. And what that would mean is that all of your requests, for example, go through the bad guy. He, the bad guy claims that all of the websites that correspond to the places you want to go are actually his IP address. And that would put this attacker then on path to do man-in-the-middle attacks and, and other sorts of uh, TCP injection attacks and so forth. Another example of a, of a true story of a, of a cross-site request forgery. So there was a, a victim computer had a Java-based stock ticker on his broker's website, and this had cookie access. So this was back in the days when Java was a thing on the internet. So there was a Java-based stock ticker, and uh, it was able to, in effect, be logged into their brokerage website. Now, this victim presumably only just wanted information about how their stocks were doing, not to actually trade, not to actually do buys and sells on, on their stock account. However, there's no segregation in this in this in this case. The brokerage websites, if they were logged in, they would they would be able to see all of their stocks and how all their stocks are doing and as well do everything else with their brokerage account, do trades and so forth. And if they weren't logged in, they didn't get any of this information. So in order for the stock ticker to work, they needed cookie access so they could see what the positions of, of, the, users, uh, of the users' stocks were. And so then there was a comment put on a public message board based on, on finance at yahoo.com pointing to some leaked news. And the victim clicks on this link, leaked news story to get some information and, and loses $5,000. So what exactly happened? So when the, used, when the victim clicked a link, in effect, just clicked a link and loaded a website, that link caused the following things to happen. It changed the victim's email notification settings for their brokerage account. It linked to a new checking account. So normally such an action would cause an email notification to go out, but the email notifications had changed. So they're no longer going to the victim. They're going to the attacker. Then they transferred $5,000, they unlinked the new checking account, and they restored email notification. So all of this, in effect, would have happened seamlessly to the user. They wouldn't have gotten their notification, and $5,000 would have been sent out of their account. All because they were all through cross-site request forgeries. No other... No other attack was necessary other than the fact that there was this, this uh, cookie access JavaScript that, that, that was running, Java program that was running for a stock ticker. So thankfully, um, both the victim and the attacker were security researchers exploring the world of cross-site request forgery, so no one was actually harmed. But still, nevertheless, it's important to have safeguards in place if you're going to allow real-world consequences or even in virtual-world consequences to occur as a result of simple things like GET requests. Because any website can cause you to issue GET requests and you will automatically append your cookie so as to make them look authenticated. So what do we do? How do we stop this? So what are some defenses that we can have to protect users from cross-site request forgeries? So one immediate one is we could require them to re-authenticate. So sure, it's fine to um, rely on cookies, uh, cookie-based authentication for casual transactions with the website or for personalization or things like that. But as soon as there's going to be something with consequences, we prompt the user to re-enter their password. 
right? And this is importantly different than just having the user click another OK button, because of course, the click of that second OK button can also then be for or uh, tricked by the user can be tricked into doing that by another site. But if the user is required to enter in some information that presumably the user alone knows, like their password, then prompting the user again for their password would at least require that the user actually is aware of the transaction occurring. So you can imagine them doing this before doing things like executing a bank transfer or performing a stock trade or changing their profile settings. Another benefit, and you may see this approach being used and it's not necessarily to fight cross-site request forgeries, is that it has the additional benefit that if your account is typically remains logged in all the time, such as your Amazon account, for example, because Amazon makes it quite tedious to try to sign out correctly. So it remains just logged in all the time. Now, anyone who gains access to your computer can do things such as buying things, having them expensed to your credit card and shipped to your, your address. Now, if they want to add a new address, for example, then you're going to have a prompt appear that you'll have to re-enter your password. So even though you're logged in and your cookie remains available, this re-prompting of uh, your password is not actually to fight a cross-site request forgery, but instead to re-authenticate the user in case someone else is actually using their computer because they're about to issue a transaction that has a high cost if done incorrectly. Another defense is known as referrer validation. So HTML requests can include an origin header or also known as a referrer header. And uh, note that the referrer here is spelled wrong because it was just spelled wrong by the guy who wrote it up many years ago. And that's just how the internet works. Is this just going to stay wrong forever? So the referrer header is able to refer to the name of the script that actually caused the request to occur, meaning that the browser knows that some script from evil.com is the script that's causing the user's browser to go to good.com and make a get request for some domain. So for instance, you could inform good.com that actually this is happening, that it's not the user on their own who is issuing this request, but this request is coming from somewhere else, from evil.com. There is a script that the user loaded from some other origin, and that is the that is who is referring this request. And then it's up to the server how to respond. It could, for instance, disallow any scripts from that come from non from outside of their own origin. So it could say that the referrer has to actually match good.com or else it simply won't honor the request. It'll it simply ignore it. So this, of course, can be missing. Not every browser is going to include referrer headers. Of course, referrer headers further raise privacy concerns because now it's telling other sites about where you're visiting and what's causing things to load. So there's going to be some tracking capabilities that would otherwise not be present if these, if these headers are not there. Um, and there is an option for strict validation. So you can, you can require that these referrers are provided in order for you to use the site. But again, such defenses are that may be vary across different browsers or perform differently are not usually the best ways to go ahead and, and solve these problems. So the best way of solving the cross-site request forgery, or at least maybe not, so to, so to speak, the best way, but the best practices as it stands right now, is to just simply have a random number on every transaction that is not able to be known by the 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 cross-site script. So when the request forgery comes in, the request forgery is tricking the user into issuing a GET request with a bunch of values. And these values might be what they're trying to do, for instance, send some amount of money to some person. Now, what the burden now placed on the good website, the one that's trying to protect its users from having these cross-site request forgeries occur is that in addition to all of the information on their forms, like who should get the money and how much money should be sent, there is a further hidden input field with a random number generated for that purpose. So every single time a user is given a button that they can click that causes an actual side effect, 
it is the responsibility of the server who's providing it to include a random number that must be repeated back to the server along with that request. And only when that number matches correctly to the number the server knew it generated should the request be honored. That means that the evil script that tricks the user into loading a, uh, a website across origins will simply not be able to know this number. Recall that they cannot read because of the same origin policy. So there is a prohibition against this random number that is delivered from the good website to the user. There's a prohibition that prevents the user from being able to send it to the evil website unless the user is somehow tricked into actually doing it uh, and giving it to the evil website. There's no way for the evil website to access the DOM of the good website and learn what this value is because of the same origin policy. And this includes even if they were responsible for that being loaded uh, through an iframe or, or something like that. So the security then of web interactions that have side effects all comes down to relying on servers to always include these hidden random numbers every single time you're going to have a transaction with side effects. And these tokens, of course, must be checked. It's usually the case that bad values are rejected, but some implementations have missing values that aren't rejected. And presumably this could be for backwards compatibility. So they wanted to make sure that older versions, for some reason, that were missing these values were still able to work correctly. However, the result of this is that if you disel if you reject incorrect values, but you don't mind that if they're missing, then the bad guy can just have them missing and, and, and still harm the user. So it's important that they are randomly generated. They need to be unpredictable, so cryptographically secure randomness. They need to be random every single time. They need to be not tied to the session, not tied to the cookie, values that are not guessable and must be provided with every single time the user could do an interaction with a website that can cause a side effect. Now, thankfully, this is a well-known and established problem with security on the web, and so any decent uh, web development framework will have some notation like this one, where you can just simply say, I need to protect this method with a cross-site request forgery. Just a simple annotation that says, by the way, also do all of that work to fig make sure that there is no ability for cross-site request forgeries to occur. Because this is a well-known issue that, in effect, all web servers, all web services that have side effects must, uh, must work, uh, must do something to prevent from evil scripts from being able to do these request forgeries. So in summary, I just wanted to leave these questions to think about, which is, how is a cross-site request forgery token both like a cookie and how is it unlike a cookie? So think in terms of their security purposes, where they, where they exactly fit in, what they represent, and uh, compare, these two, compare these two concepts.